Greetings. Welcome to our second presentation on loading. In this presentation, we will focus on dynamic loading, different from the static loading, the more simple version that we looked at in our first presentation. There are numerous YouTube videos that we will look at, or a portion of them at least. They're here for your reference. I'm not going to walk you through them now. And on to the subject. So dynamic loads. So mechanics, which we have discussed, the branch of science that we are studying. Um, dynamics is concerned about the relationship of the motion of bodies and its causes. causes. So motion being the operative word, the key word there, different from um, statics. So unlike statics, where force where the net force is equal to zero, as we discussed. So equations are ins insufficient for determining the internal forces and the reactions on, on the structure. So we talked about the importance of, um, which is really the focus of our course, is on statics and how basically math and algebra could s solve all of these problems. Here in dynamic loading, um, that's not the case. It's, it's, it's a lot more complex and simple algebraic equations will not um, suffice for s figuring these problems out. And it is responsible for many disastrous structural failures. So very, very important, heavy subject. The difference between dynamic and static loading. So the difference is for um, static loading would be more akin to gently s stepping onto your bathroom scale in the morning. And dynamic loading would be jumping across the bathroom onto the scale where a load can double for a short period of time. So the harder that you step onto a scale, the more that that weight will jump beyond um, our actual weight. Um, and and that's that's the dynamic effect, essentially. So kind of, um, yeah, so just, just an analogy, really, between the two, between static and dynamic loads. So seismic terminology. So seismic refers to earthquakes. This, that's one of the big, um, one of the big categories that, that make up dynamic loading. So ground shaking, so the pushing back and forth sideways and up and down of the ground generates internal forces within the buildings called inertial force from inertia. Um, typically, earthquakes move back and forth, um, less up and down, mostly back and forth. So the force, the force that this, this um, back and forth creates is called, again, the inertial, the F inertial force, and that is a product of the mass of the building plus the acceleration with which the earth is moving. So the greater the mass of the building, the greater the force. So the, the heavier something is, the, um, the more inertia that it's going to have. A lot of um, people mistakenly believed, engineers mistakenly believed, well, or, or I shouldn't say mistakenly, but they, they, they didn't understand the full uh, ramifications of their thought. They, they thought that heavier bridges would, would be harder to start moving. And, and there was a period of time when they started building heavy bridges for that reason. And while that's true, and we're going to see a bridge in a little bit, um, while that's true, once that heavy bridge starts to move, it's harder to slow down, actually. So that's where the mass part comes in. So it's kind of a mixed blessing, you might say. Harder to get moving, but once something that's heavy starts moving, it's harder to stop it, which can be very dangerous. So lightweight construction um, with less mass with less mass is typically advantageous in seismic design, actually. So lighter weight buildings, because they do not get moving as much. All right. So earthquakes generate waves that may be slow or long, short or abrupt. The full uh, the length of that full cycle in seconds is called its period. All right. So. These are, these are the waves that make, make buildings start to move. And then there's a cycle to things moving, kind of a back and forth. And, and how long it takes something to move back and forth is what we call its period. All objects, including buildings, have natural or fundamental periods at which they vibrate if jolted or shocked. This is a primary consideration in seismic design. So when that earthquake hits, everything is going to jolt and move. And, and the, the issue, the concern is how quickly does it actually um, stop or, and slow down? So small objects, so, so this, these are kind of percentiles or um, factors, I would say. So a small object would have a, a tino, tiny, relatively tiny natural period. So you could imagine if a seismic shock hit a city, a filing cabinet would kind of knock back and forth, one, two, three, and it would be done. It would, it would be a fraction of a second, probably. 
small buildings um, would take a little bit longer. And as you see, the taller the building, the heavier the building, the longer it's going to take to slow it down. It has a, a much longer natural period. Um, if the period of the shock wave and the natural period of the building coincide, then the buildings will resonate and its vibration will increase or amplify several times. All right, so, so we go back and all these things have this kind of a natural, um, the object itself has this natural period where it's going to rock back and forth. And then the shock wave also has a kind of a period of sorts. And when the two of them coincide, then um, things are amplified and it becomes problematic. And that's what creates what we call resonant forces. Forces have a dynamic effect when they are repeatedly applied in rhythm. They, they are then resonant forces or in resonance with the structure. They are dangerous even if the initial value is low because repeated rhythmic forces accumulate and reach much larger values. So I think um, pushing a child on a swing or anyone on a swing for that matter is a, uh, a great example of that. You know that with small pushes, you know, I think you know intuitively with just tiny pushes that are just um, all similar in, in the amount of strength that you're exerting, that the child will actually, um, you know, go higher and higher and higher on the swing. And you're not changing the amount of energy that you're putting into the pushing, but you are just kind of carefully putting your, your, your push is coinciding with the kind of the natural swing of the child. And those two gestures, you know, the natural period of the swing and your pushing, those two, um, your gesture kind of coincides with it. It just it creates it, it, like the, um, you're, you're kind of making the natural period work for itself, do, do a lot of the work itself. So that is the um, initial value, small pushes, but they, they grow. So little pushes in resonance with swing periods produce much larger effects. Okay, so let's take a look at these two videos here quickly. Okay, the first is uh, kind of a silly video, um, but it's about a swing. And it has some creepy haunted music that I will leave on for you. over just, just a minute long, so we'll watch it in its entirety, and then we'll return. <laughs> Okay, so I think that swing video kind of was helpful, cute, but helpful. Um, and just interesting how the, the swings next to it were not moving, actually. But, you know, that little leaf kind of coming coming through did show that there was actually wind. So, um, interesting. So, they refer to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, um, otherwise known as Galloping Gertie. Let's just uh, take a look at that here. Let's just look at, we don't need the music anymore, I don't think. Um, so if you haven't seen this, this was this is a you know kind of a landmark case study in bridge design, um, and obviously very very dramatic. Um, and this this is this is a big point um, referring to what my my earlier comment about the weight of bridges. So this this was a time when they were making heavy bridges because it was harder to because 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 the thought was that heavy bridges are harder to get moving, which is true. But again, once the wind grabbed this bridge and started moving it, um, it just it just wouldn't let up. The resonance, the, the wind plus the natural period of the bridge 
it just took hold and would not let it go until um, obviously it was destroyed. Okay, so that sums up that slide. I think we have an understanding of resonant forces now. Um, all right, so lateral forces. So this is very important. And um, these, so these are forces that move from the side, come, come in from the side, basically. And there are several different variations or places where they come from. So wind is one of the most common and one of the most complex forces that structural engineers have to contend with when it comes to um, building design. Very, very unpredictable wind. So this is the building here, actually, in white. And we talked about triangulated loads. Um, and I, so I think we, we saw this diagram actually probably in our last video. Um, so here's the building and then there's our triangulated load where the pressures are greatest up at the top and um, come down and reduce as they get closer to the bottom. And then on the, on the opposite side, there's a leeward, leeward pressure as well. Um, so that is wind, which we have discussed some. Seismic forces, again, we discussed a little bit, so and we'll see more in um, some other videos. So this is, again, the Earth kind of go shaking back and forth very, very quickly and kind of creating this shearing effect down at the bottom here. So this is where, where the Earth pushes in one direction, but the building wants to stay put. So the Earth is forcing, you know, sh shooting to the right very quickly, but the, but the building, you know, by, by kind of naturally just wants to stay put being as heavy as it is especially and that's what creates a shearing effect down at the bottom down at the base of those columns um, okay so shake tables let's uh, we'll look at another video actually in a second so a shake table is a um, in universities that have structural engineering programs these are how they study so th these are models of skyscrapers and these these platforms here will shake back and forth so that they can study the um, the effects of, of seismic design. And we'll take a quick look at a video here where they have the uh, world's largest shake table, actually. All right, this, so we're on the video now here. It is, um, it is, uh, you will see the title, World's Largest Shake Table is the name of the YouTube video. Um, so it's about a six and a half minute video. We're just gonna watch a couple of seconds of it. You'll, you'll get the idea of it. Coming to see this, when you see an actual test, impact that that has on you is so significant that it really makes you think twice about what you put down on paper. All right, so that, that should have given you a quick sense as to what the shake table is about. It is, um, it's a very interesting video, actually. I just don't feel the need to um, incorporate it all into this video, but I do encourage you to go and um, take a longer look at it. There's a lot of interesting commentary. And um, I kind of, when I was first watching it, I was kind of laughing at the curtains and the table um, being there, like, why would they do something like that? But it, I think it, I think it is there actually to really kind of drive home the point. When when you see the whole building shaking a little bit from outside, um, it doesn't it, it doesn't give you as strong of a visual. I think. I mean, it's definitely moving and kind of alarmingly so. But I think the curtains um, really kind of drive home the magnitude of the uh, the test. Okay, so let's continue on with our lateral forces. So now um, fluid pressure from water. So this we discussed as well when we were talking about our triangulated forces. So there's immense pressure obviously built up um, behind this dam. And very important to note, we are um, learning about our six basic um, structural members. And this one is an arch lying on its side. So it is an arch experiencing compression from the side. So that's what a, a dam is like. Um, so fluid pressure on the basement wall, very, very important issue. And these diagrams, a little fuzzy, um, explain here we have two eight foot walls. Here we have two 10 foot walls. And here at the top we have sand or gravel. And here we have sand or gravel, so an 8 foot with sand and gravel, 10 foot with sand and gravel, 8 foot with clay, and 10 foot with clay. So when you take um, 
material and methods kind of classes or you study it on your own, you will learn more about the importance of all the different soil types. So clay holds a lot of water where sand and gravel lets the water run through it. So that is why the same wall um, with sand or gravel only has about 1,250 pounds per square foot of pressure building up, where here the clay is holding so much moisture that it has twice that amount of pressure building up, actually. So ideally, if I were building a house from scratch for myself, I would have this all backfilled with gravel, and you'd have to uh, um, keep it you know, wrapped in fabric to keep it nice and clean. But if you want to protect your basement walls, you surround them with gravel. So all the water that enters the earth there just runs right past your house. Okay, so that is fluid pressure. Um, so bridges, obviously the piers and caissons, piles that hold up our bridges, obviously experiencing a lot of, a lot of um, lateral fluid pressure from the water. And basement walls, which we were also just looking at. We were talking about water in the previous one, but part of it's soil as well. So this, this slide is um, really describing um, the impact of water saturating this, this these types of soil. Here we're just generally talking about soil being on the wall without the water um, kind of adding to it. So here's our triangulated um, load smallest at the top where we stand on grade at the earth and then down at the bottom of our basement wall where the wall meets the footing the pressure is the greatest so inverted the opposite of the wind on a tall building triangulated but inverted and obviously massive retaining walls like this are holding um, immense amounts of weight all right so those are the lateral forces that um, are coming in and affecting our buildings all right, so this is an important point. Um, let's, uh, let's look at an, another a very amusing video on the center of gravity of an object. Okay, so this is an added note later. The uh, Soul Man Finds His Center video was flagged for copyright issues, so a fun and interesting video, but Soul Man does not want to share his videos with students. Um, probably not him, obviously, so I'm just kind of making a joke there, but um, take a look. Take a look at this video. It is fun and kind of interesting, but um, I can't duplicate it here, so please uh, take a look on your own. All right, so an amusing video on the center of gravity. So the important part of that is how the center of gravity is, is um, aligned, is aligned with the, um, with the structure kind of below it. So that's what we're talking about is alignment essentially here. So configuring lateral stabilizing elements, all right? So lateral stabilizing elements. So the lateral, again, is referring to the wind or the water or the earthquake, something coming in from the side. And stabilizing elements are our structural elements that we add to buildings to fight back against those lateral pressures. Um, so they are crucial in effect in um, the effectiveness of resisting such forces, yes must be arranged in a balanced and symmetrical um, as balanced and symmetrical of a fashion as possible all right so this is why engineers typically like um, symmetry and things being aligned it's because it's very effective and cost efficient all right so the center of mass should align with the center of resistance okay so here, here, here we're looking at a floor plan, and here we're looking at a three-dimensional sketch of that same floor plan. So we have two columns, one, two, one, two, wall, and wall. So this is a building or a floor or um, whatever, a por portion of a building to make the illustration. And the, so let's see, so here, let's read through here. So um, this figure shows the torsional effects, so the twisting effects created by a simple building configuration. Torsion is occurring because a uniformly distributed lateral load is not resisted by a uniformly distributed lateral resistance. So, torsion is occurring because a uniformly distributed lateral force. So, the uniform, uniformly distributed lateral force is the black arrow. So, all these little arrows is showing the uniform, the uniformity of it all. That's how we show a uniform load. And the black arrow, I think, just kind of sums up the center of that uniform load. And here it is in the floor plan showing its dead center in the space. However, it's not resisted by a uniformly distributed lateral resistant. And the resisting force is the wall. The wall is what will help this building 
um, not rack, essentially, and kind of twist from any wind coming in from the side. And there's only one wall off on the left side, and the two columns, columns don't add any lateral resistance. A column could easily just kind of knock down, um, or knock down a lot more, fall down, get damaged a lot more easily than a wall would. You could imagine if wind is coming in from the side, the wall is much more effective as a lateral resistant, um, a, a lateral stabilizing element. Columns are not in, not, not part of this discussion, basically. So the resistance is all off on the left. Therefore, the, um, the forces coming in on the center, the resistance on the left, they are not perfectly aligned. And therefore, we get a torsional or twisting effect happening around that wall. And that's what that arrow is showing there. So this all speaks of the importance of symmetry and balance in our in our buildings if they don't appear if they don't appear symmetrical to the eye then the engineers just have to compensate it compensate for it they just have to um you know structurally deal with it over here in some other fashion so that this arrow does align all right it doesn't mean that every building has to literally be symmetrical you know to our naked eye um, it just means that structurally we have to move that point in alignment with the forces that it's going to experience um, all right, so what are the elements that we use to stabilize? So they are shear walls, brace frames, and rigid frames, all right? So there are some architectural considerations that we are concerned about. So they have a very big effect on the exterior form, what it appears like, as well as the inside space planning. The stronger the force they have to be designed for, the bigger the architectural impact that they will have. They could be used singly or in combination to fight back against these lateral forces. Shear walls most commonly are made up of reinforced concrete, most commonly incorporated into the building's core or stair tower, and that does double duty that it also protects them as an emergency egress. So in case of a fire, we could get out and we're in a protected um, concrete uh, stair shaft, essentially, and they should not have many openings. Just doors is the bare minimum so that we could get in and out of them, essentially. So these are our shear walls in blue here, okay? And here are our cores. Stair and elevator cores would be attached to them and they would be buried in the center of the building. Very, very important to understand is that if this building were to be knocked over by the wind, it would be its most vulnerable in, along its short axis. So the wind is coming in this direction. This is the short axis of the building. This is the long axis. Buildings are vulnerable in the short direction, highly unlikely that the building is going to fall over in this direction along its long axis, much more likely that it would fall over or be damaged in the short direction. So that's why the concrete shear walls run in the direction of the short axis. Okay. Braced frames we're familiar with. So this is our triangular bracing. There are many different flavors that it comes in. So composed of open triangulated frames, steel and wood, better suited for exterior walls than shear walls because they allow for more window openings. Here is what appears to be a parking garage having a pretty serious retrofit. And then rigid frames. So these are our steel, and we'll learn a lot more about these when we get to our um, units on steel. So they depend on extra stiff connections, most commonly steel, required welded connections, all right? So um, rigid connections, bolted connections are not rigid connections, all right? They need additional steel, they need additional stiffeners. So this magenta line running around here would be the weld. These blue plates would be additional additional stiffeners that have been added here within the um, the column web and then we see that they're also tacked in with a little bit of um, welding as well so it can be accomplished with sight cast concrete with rigid connections within the um, reinforcing steel as well we will talk more about that as well in a later unit concrete plus reinforcing steel the absence of solid walls and bracing makes it the most appealing system. So architecturally speaking, it just leaves nice open um, exterior walls so that we have the most flexibility with windows, which could be an architectural priority um, in some for some buildings. 
However, it's also the most inefficient system, making it only suitable for low, broad buildings that require modest resistance, all right? So you are not going to see this. this. This is not a solution for skyscrapers. When you look up at high-rises and skyscrapers and you see those beautiful steel frames, understand that it's not those steel frames that are resisting the wind. They are incapable of doing that. It is this, the concrete cores that are doing all that work. This is only good for small, low buildings. Um, and then we'll just look at a couple of images here of um, uh, some other ways that these this kind of um, bracing and um, these systems take place. So th these are some nice vintage diagrams. I love old buildings. So this would be uh, um, wood wood framing essentially. So and and vintage because now plywood is is um, standard by code. So here we have braces being let into. So let in just means they're kind of carved. Um, cut into, cut into, so they're kind of in the same plane. Um, so that's what we see happening here. Again, more bracing. And then here there's a, a diagonal bracing or sheathing. Again, this is all very obsolete now. If you do renovation work of old houses here where I live in Philadelphia, um, there are lots of old houses, beautiful old houses, so it's very important to become familiar with the old systems so you know what you're looking at. Um, but obsolete today, plywood does all that, that work. So again, the studs in a house, again, that those do not offer lateral resistance. Those are hold, those are carrying loads from above. Those are carrying the people, the furniture, the snow loads from above. But if we're talking about wind coming in from the side, we need bracing. And down in um, hurricane prone areas like Florida, for instance, houses are required to have a huge amount of steel bracing. I was speaking to a home builder in Florida once and he was telling me how the um, the steel bracing that and, and the tie downs that that are used to connect the wood sills to the to the concrete and um, basically tie all the wooden elements um, down to the concrete directly. Tons of steel adds tens of thousands of dollars to the price of a house actually. Um, it's just the cost of living in a hurricane prone area and panel sheathing so here and um, early on in my career when i was doing some framing in other parts of the country where codes were a little more liberal than they are here in philadelphia we were actually just required to put plywood on the corners of the buildings and here in the field you would call it or not in the corners this would all just be rigid insulation so it would save money so by code, the plywood is was only needed at the corners, and that's where it did its maximum amount, amount of work for that shear resistance. So you could imagine these studs being pushed on from the side. They would, they would quite easily um, rack or collapse or be pushed to the side. But once you put this piece of plywood on, it's, it's, it's producing a, a huge amount of lateral resistance. And same with um, panels. This one's Judging by the thickness of it, it's probably um, an insulated panel um, or a load-bearing wall panel. Okay. And then one final um, piece to look at, a uh, high-end, very high-end, very expensive. So the Taipei 101 skyscraper has a tuned mass damper. takes up five floors up at the top. So here we are at the 92nd down to the 87th floor. Five floors, this massive ball. So this is very much akin to having a um, a pool, a swimming pool on the top of a high-rise building, which will, the swimming pool kind of having this, you know, organic water in it actually helps resist um, lateral forces like earthquakes. So it's it's not something, it, it, the, the weight of the water helps, but also the fact that the water moves fluidly with the, um, with any lateral forces that the building is experiencing. So that's kind of a great analogy for this um, tuned mass damper. So 800 tons, the thing is massive. It's steel, many different layers coming in at um, about 12 and a half centimeters. So that's about three inches or so for um, four inches, perhaps for uh, each steel plate. So massive, massive um, object. And here we can see it hanging from these cables. And there it is getting constructed. Let's, uh, let's take a quick look at a video of this in place.
Okay, an interesting video. Um, not high quality video, but interesting nonetheless to see this thing moving ever so slowly. So that is this massive ball is moving um, in kind of in reaction to the wind pushing on the building. And it's, it's again, organic and fluid and helping to slow down that, that period of the building. Again, that, that building has been pushed somehow, wind, earth movement. Um, if you've if, if you've ever been in high-rise buildings, skyscrapers up at the top, they move up there, and they're supposed to. That's And again, that going back to the theme of this whole lecture, those are dynamic forces, and that's what makes it so much more complex, is when um, typically we don't like our buildings to move, but when you get to the top of a high-rise that's experiencing, could experience extreme winds, you want it to move so that it um, doesn't just be, be, basically break and fracture. So... Uh, movement is expected, and this helps to dampen that movement. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. I think it's a very interesting subject. It's it's probably the only time we're really going to take a um, kind of a side trip off of our uh, journey into statics and, um, you know, static forces. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you.